everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. On behalf of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro and OCAD, I want to welcome and thank you all. Um, my name is Aline Sirfari, and I'm here today with Dr. Hilary Humans, who co coordinates and moderates this series with me. Our guest speakers to today are Dr. Paulo Elito, Dr. Miriam Verdella, Dr. Chani Chang, <laughs> and Dr. Tatiane Cantarelli, who is sitting right next to me. <laughs> Um, the presentations today will be recorded and available on demand on the OCAD website, uh, which is ocadmsk.com, and on the YouTube channel of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro. If you want to join the OCAD community, consider registering on the OCAD website. This session will focus on sports imaging. The speakers will present their cases, and at the end, we will have a Q&A session. If you have questions uh, at any time during the presentations, please put them in the chat box. And at the end, the speakers will respond to them. Just a quick reminder, attendees have not been given the permission to screen record any of these presentations as they may contain material under copyright. An authorized recording use and dis distribution and sale of this material without permission from the speaker is illegal. We thank you for your understanding. And with that, I'll kick off the session. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Paulo Elito. It's his second time in this virtual stage this year. Thank you, Paulo. Dr. Paulo Elito is a musculoskeletal radiologist at Hospital Sirio Libanês uh, and the current section head of MSK Radiology at Hospital das Clínicas of the University of Sao Paulo. He graduated with a degree in medicine from the University of Sao Paulo, a medical residency in radiology and diagnostic imaging, a fellowship in MSK radiology, and a doctoral degree in medical sciences at the Instituto de Radiologia do Hospital das Clínicas. He has co-authored book chapters and authored and co-authored several papers on MSK radiology, orthopedic imaging, and other areas including imaging on the spine neuromuscular disorders and rheumatology. He's an active participant of the Sociedade Paulista de Radiologia, where he has coordinated uh, the MSK group from 2017 to 2019. And he's also a board certified radiologist member of the Brazilian College of Radiology. Paulo, please take it away. Thank you, Aline. Uh... And thank you, Hilary, for the invitation. Thank you, Aline, for the kind introduction. Uh, are you all able to see my screen? Yes, no? No, it's not in presenter mode. Oh, sorry. Okay. It is now, thank you. Okay. So once again, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I am really honored to be part of, the, of this meeting with such great radiologists. And I'll start with my case. So uh, this is a 10 year old boy that uh, really uh, practiced a lot of soccer, so he practiced every day. He was a youth soccer player, and he also liked to play for leisure, and had no no previous knee injury or systemic diseases, no history of any kind of injury. And he presented in the uh, emergency department with an acute anterior knee pain when jumping during a soccer practice. And at the clinical examination, he had some anterior knee tenderness and joint effusion. Uh, according to the orthopedists, but, uh, and the clinical hypothesis were osgood schlatter disease, jumper's knee, uh, osteochondral lesion of the patellofemoral joint, and some, or any extensor tendinosis. So the workup was initially some radi radiographies, and this is a, uh, the images of 
the patient's uh, knee, the left knee, where it could only appreciate some uh, small fragments, a small bone fragment near the anterior tibial tuberosity and the rest of the exam and some mild joint effusion, but mainly a, nothing in the patellofemoral joint. So he under, underwent an MRI uh, and re, he really did have some sclerotic, sclerotic fragments in the anterior tibial tuberosity, but no inflammation over here. So there's no signs of acute, uh, anything acute at the anterior tibial tuberosity. Anything uh, in the meniscus, nothing in the meniscus or uh, in the femorotibial compartments. And we're going to have a look at his patellofemoral uh, joints where he can appreciate this abnormality at the lateral trochlea. So we can see some uh, fluid here between the lateral uh, facet cartilage and here at the sulcus and some uh, hypersignal rim at the interface between the cartilage and the subchondral bone and also some abnormalities at the uh, subchondral bone with some small cysts and a lot of bone marrow edema that we can also appreciate at the sagittal images. So we have this fluid discontinuity at the cartilage with very uh, well-defined regular margins and it's perpendicular to the subchondral bone and this rim of hypersignal that we cannot see over here but we can see uh, beneath the, the this part of the lateral trochlea the superior part and the bone marrow abnormalities uh, with cysts uh, at the subchondral bone and some bone marrow edema. So the initial diagnosis was a discussion if this is an osteochondritis dissecans or an acute chondral fracture. Uh, so to understand uh, how we differentiate those two entities, we have to understand how osteochondritis dissecans occur. So uh, it's uh, a disease of that can occur in, in a wide range of ages, but mainly occurs in pre-adolescence. And it is idiopathic, but can be related to micro trauma and some overuse of the knee. But what we have to understand is that osteochondritis dissecans is an inside out process. So it starts at the epiphyseal growth plate uh, and the subchondral bone and then involves the cartilage. So uh, we have to have an osteochondral fragment and not only cartilage fragment. Also the location at the knee the osteochondritis dissecans is very rare at the trochlea. And regarding imaging, the, radiogra the radiography, the x-ray is uh, mm -hmm. normal in about half of the cases. And uh, at MRI, we'll, we'll have a subchondral bone abnormality. Some, uh, we can or cannot have fluid rim around the osteochondral fragment or a cartilage discontinuity. And at the late stages, we can have a detached or uh, dislocated fragment. Whereas the acute chondral fracture is uh, sheer cartilage fractures without osseous attachment. So what occurs is that the the uh, we have the detachment of the cartilage from the subchondral bone without any bone attached to it. And the causes are mainly traumatic, uh, either patellar dislocation, torsion trauma, or direct trauma. And they can, if a uh, uh, pre-adolescent or adolescent is practicing a lot of sports, he's susceptible to, to this kind of injury. And the uh, x-ray is usually normal because there, there is no... Uh, subchondral bone abnormality and the, the MRI will show a well-defined chondral detachment with fluid between the cartilage and the subchondral bone and some bone abnormalities in the uh, late stages. What is interesting about this kind of fracture is that the cartilage without bone has very limited healing capacity and the fragment is usually has usually a lot of instability and risk of dislocation and if untreated uh, this patient will uh, 
will have an early osteoarthrosis. The treatment options, some others uh, include a conservative treatment, which is questionable, but usually it's fragment fixation or some reconstruction of the cartilage with uh, membranes. And just remember the OCD signs of instability will include a lot of imaging findings, but the T2 high signal intensity rim uh, between the fragment and the native bone uh, is a sign of instability, especially if it's similar to fluid. A fluid field cysts in the bone beneath the lesion and the line extending through the cartilage overlying the lesion are signs of instability. So our, our patient probably had a, uh, a fragment of chondral fragment with uh, instability, even though it wasn't an OCD. So this patient denied surgical treatment. He, neither uh, the patient or the family wanted to go to operative treatment. So it was proposed a conservative treatment with early follow-up. Even though uh, advised not to practice soccer, he, he continued to, pro to play a lot. And at the one month uh, follow-up, he was asymptomatic. At two months follow-up, he underwent an MR, still asymptomatic where we can still see the cartilage detached from the subchondral bone, and we can appreciate uh, that there is a uh, very well-defined fluid signal beneath the cartilage defect. And also in the sagittal image, the same. We can see that there is fluid, so this is probably a, a fragment that, that has a lot of instability, high chance of dislocation. So here's the evolutive images, so we can uh, see that there is more fluid beneath the, the, the cartilage, even though there is less subchondral abnormalities. The patient still denies surgical treatment and continued to play soccer. And three months after the diagnosis, he presented another episode of acute pain. And here is the MR. Now we can see a lot of joint effusion and we can appreciate that the fragment, the bone fragment is dislo the chondral fragment is dislocated at this lateral recess of the knee. And there is no cartilage uh, over the, the lateral trochlear. At the sagittal images, we can see the chondral fragment and the chondral defect. And here we can see at the, the highlights of the case. So this is a dislocated fragment. There is no cartilage over the lateral trochlea, and there is the dislocated fragment at the lateral recess. So now the patient accepted the operative treatment and he went to an arthrotomy with uh, autograft. So the fragment was particulated and fixated with coverage uh, using a collagen membrane uh, with uh, good stability after the operative images. And here is the cartilage fragment. Here is the prepared uh, bone ba the bed of the of the graft. So here is the particulated grafting and the covered with the membrane. One year after surgery, the patient was asymptomatic and he was back to soccer practice with no pain. And here you can see that the, there is a tissue overlying the defect. There is not a hyaline cartilage because there is some uh, areas of low signal, but there is a, a pretty decent coverage of the de defect. And three years after surgery, it's not a very thick tissue, but there is, and there is, there are areas of uh, fibrous tissue, but there is a pretty decent coverage of the defect, and the patient was asymptomatic. So, the take-home messages of the case are that acute chondral fractures are severe injuries and often related to trauma and sports injuries that occur in adolescents. And the chondral fragments without bone have low healing potential and are usually uh, have usually a lot of instability and can dislocate. And the complications include the displacement of the chondral fragment and early osteoarthritis. So this was the case. Uh, thank you again, Alini and Hillary, for the invitation. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Paulo. Beautiful case and beautiful follow-up too. I was going to say that. Okay, my turn. Connie. Connie Chang. Connie Chang is a native of Boston. 
She completed her medical school in New York City and then returned to Boston for residency and has stayed there. She fell in love with musculoskeletal radiology, especially the medical side, tumors and infection, and has focused her clinical and research efforts on interventions related to these diseases. She's also the fellowship director and has loved this role more and more over the years. And she thinks it helps her keep a pulse on the current state of radiology and how it's evolving. Connie wants me to tell you that she first got to know me through OCAD and her most memorable time was being chained and jailed with fellow OCADers for an hour. And um, she told she told me to tell you, I can tell you about that at another time. She's honored to be here and she looks forward to getting to know the Brazilian MSK community more. Okay, Connie, share your screen and you already are. Okay. You guys see, okay, great. <laughs> Thanks so much, Hillary and Tatiana for the invitation. Um, I love doing this. Um, so I'm gonna talk, start today with a 44 year old man with acute hand pain uh, after whacking his hand against a slide. Some of you might be thinking, how is this a sports injury? Well, any of you who's, who guys have kids or have played with kids know that playing with them can be <laughs> a sport activity in itself. And what I'm gonna do, I have no disclosures, is I'm gonna scroll through these cases. There's gonna be a series um, of similar cases. I'm gonna give you guys some time to look at the case. And also that way later in the video, you can go back and look for yourself uh, more specifically in the stack. All right, so this is the first case. And so now going on to like the index or most important slice. So we're at the level of the metacarpal head. Here's the ulnar and radial side. And you can see this is the tendon. And normally there are sagittal bands that come off on each side. They look like little uh, um, chicken feet, you know, uh, coming off. And uh, here on the radial side, we don't hardly see anything. So it is completely torn. On the ulnar side, it may be torn as well, but we can see on the proton density images that there is still something there. Um, and so it's probably stretched but intact, um, either a partial tear or a sprain, but completely torn on the radial side. So when we think of sagittal band tears, we typically think of the boxer's knuckle, but actually that's only one of the three potential mechanisms for uh, sagittal band tears. It can be a direct blow like the doctor's knuckle, but also with forced flexion of the knuckle and flexion and ulnar deviation of the wrist, you can also tear the sagittal band, or uh, it can be a spontaneous rupture. So there are reports, oh, I'm sorry, uh, where the, uh, patient has just snapped their fingers or crumpled a piece of paper and have actually torn the sagittal band. So we'll look at some of each of these cases. Um, now this first one is, uh, is similar to the boxer's knuckle in that it is probably from a direct trauma and the radial side uh, tears are actually more common, probably because it's thinner or longer or more exposed. If you just look at your hand, down at your hand, that side is more exposed, especially at the uh, index finger knuckle. Um, so here's another case, uh, a, an associated case. This is a 53-year-old male who fell off his bike during a triathlon. Um, and on the index slice, we can see the marker, which always helps show us uh, where the uh, injury is. And we can see also, again, here on the radial side, uh, there's a ghost of a tendon, uh, sorry, a ghost of, a, uh, of the sagittal band. And so again, it's thin and stretched, but still continuous. And this is prob probably another sparing or partial tear. Now we're going to the more sort of classic situation. Here's a 22 year old male who's an Olympic boxer and he's uh, over the period of his training the last couple of months had swelling and fluid. So I'm scrolling through these cases so you can, uh, the slices, you can take a look. And going to this index slice again, so you can see uh, the marker and uh, there's actually a fluid gap in the area of chronically torn radial sagittal band. So for the other two cases that were more acute, you could still see the remnants of the tissue in the space. At this point, the tissue is completely gone and replaced by this fluid gap, you know, similar to when you have an ACL tear, it's chronic. Sometimes the tissue just uh, gets resorbed and disappears. On top of that, there's ulnar deviation of the extensor tendon, which can, for somebody uh, who's an athlete can be functionally uh, limiting. And so this person, you know, most sagittal bands are treated conservatively, but this person, especially given his, uh, his um, Olympic status, um, had sagittal band reconstruction and then additional casting for two to three weeks. 
So mostly sagittal band tears are evaluated clinically. Um, and uh, it's only if you are not sure or if you're for a partial injury or you're, you're surgical planning or you're looking for associated injuries, keep that in mind because we'll talk about that shortly, um, that you go on to do an MRI. Ultrasound can also be very helpful because it's a very superficial structure. So this is a normal hand. Um, and here's the extensor digitorum tendon and the metacarpal. And again, you see the two little bands of the chicken feet coming off the edge. Those are the normal sagittal bands. This is a 31-year-old male who felt pain when he was gripping the bar when weightlifting. So maybe something more like the spontaneous tear. Here on the radial side, uh, here's the tendon. And then on the radial side, you can see the normal sagittal band. Um, but on the ulnar side, you can see the band starting to come off, but it ends in a ball abruptly, and so it is torn. That's this here is the torn and, and um, balled up uh, sagittal band. All right, so we have another 55-year-old male who felt a pop while moving furniture. So back to the index slice. So here on the ulnar side this time, um, we see that the, the sagittal band, it's this wavy, thin structure with uh, soft tissue edema in the, in the gap, and this would be more like a spontaneous sagittal band tear. Um, and you can see adjacent to it, there's another structure that comes further over to the side of the metacarpal head that is also hyper and intense. And on the coronal images, we can see that there's a sprain or partial tear of the ulnar collateral ligament. And uh, we'll keep that in mind, and we're going to look a little bit more carefully at that. This is another bicycle crash. Seems like that's another common way to injure the sagittal band, starting here first with the coronal images. So a little clue from that last case of what structure we might be looking at in addition to the sagittal band. All right, so we're going to go and look at the sagittal band and the collateral ligament and the anatomy of these two structures together. So just blowing up uh, the index slice so we can see the extensor digitorum tendon and the, and, the, and the metacarpal head. And on each side, again, we have the sagittal bands coming across, but then it continues onto the volar side of the metacarpal head and eventually actually fuses with the pulley at that level as well. But in addition, here deep to the sagittal band, we have both the collateral ligament proper and the accessory collateral ligament that fuse with the sagittal band and eventually uh, become part of that um, pulley structure as well and the flexor tendon volar plate. So because these structures are essentially linked together, they can be injured concurrently. And here in that case that we were looking at, um, we can see, first of all, there's a big, there's a bone contusion along the metacarpal head. So that tells you that there was a high impact injury. The radial sagittal band is torn. You can see it's redundant here. And in addition, there's this sort of V-like structure here that is the radial collateral ligament, which is also torn and now folded over and redundant. On the coronal image, we can see that here's the radial collateral ligament flipped uh, proximally. And here coming in is the interosseous tendon um, and so this is similar to the stenor-like lesion that can occur in the thumb. So because this radiocollateral ligament now is flipped backwards and the interosseous tendon is, in, is interposed between that but the distal end of the ligament is still close to the failing. So this is a chance of, and no redundancy or folding that we saw on the other, on the radial side. So the ulnar side may uh, heal with conservative treatment and not require surgery. So here's a 42 year old police officer with one month of pain um, after falling and landing on his right hand. Give you guys a second again to look through the slices. All right, so, sorry, that went really more distal. So here again, we can see that the radial collateral ligament is torn on the coronal images. You see the curly Q of the um, retracted ligament. And um, even though it is not uh, outside, you know, flipped so proximally the way the last case was, it is curled up. And so functionally, it is like a stenner as well. It's not gonna be able to heal on its own. And um, here coming to the axials, we can see that the radial sagittal band is also completely torn. Um, you know, there's maybe a little bit of ghost of tendon, uh, sorry, the, the sagittal band left, but it is 
quite stretched out and there's a lot of edema in the area. And as we come more volarly, we can see that the A1 pulley um, is also torn as well. So again, all those structures, the volar plate, the sagittal band and the caudal ligaments are really intimately related and with severe injuries can be torn concurrently. Um, and that this is just an example of what the A2 pulley, just going more distally, that's what the pulley should look like and we don't see that at all here. So that is a whirlwind through the MCP joint and I hope you guys enjoyed that and I'll take any questions later. Thank you so much for having me again. Thank you so much, Connie. Now it's my pleasure to introduce my dear friend, uh, Dr. Tatiana Cantarelli. She's a practicing uh, musculoskeletal radiologist at Agacor and Telemagen here in Sao Paulo, where she trained during her clinical musculoskeletal fellowship. She's also a former uh, research fellow at NYU and a member of several radiology societies in Brazil. She has authored uh, and co-authored articles on the musculoskeletal field, and she's a very active MSK educator lecturing several Brazilian radiology meetings. Please, Tatiana. Thank you. So, let's see my case. So this is a case uh, about a 16-year-old male patient. He is a juvenile soccer player uh, at midfield position. Uh, he referred persistent left side growing pain for one month after training. And at the clinical examination, he has tenderness to palpation over the left adductor longus originally. So he underwent a pubic synthesis MRI. At the top, we have the axial plane. At the bottom, we have the coronal plane image. And on the left, the T1. And on the right side, we have the T2 weight image. So this image, uh, they, uh, they show a slight asymmetry of the synthesis apophysis uh, with irregularity. Here you can see and severe bone marrow edema on the left uh, pubic. We have a uh, we have here more uh, image of the fat suppressed T2 uh, weight image on axial plane from top to the bottom uh, level. Show again the left tip of uh, apophysial irregularity. You can see here, here, and here, and. Again, bone marrow edema. And we also can see that there is an hyper intense uh, thin line that blends here with the overlying symphysial capsule posteriorly. This is consistent with a physial plate uh, fracture line with here point by these yellow arrows. There is associated periostitis and soft tissue edema that extends to the left adductor longus muscle here. Uh, the upper segment of the physial plates. Uh, bilaterally shows chronic stress induced changes with like small and tiny erosions and cyst like irregularities. So, more MRI image now on coronal plane, uh, uh, on T2 weight sequence uh, from anterior to posterior. We can see here in the MRI that shows better the left type of bone marrow edema here, here you can see here, with periocytes and soft tissue edema. There are, uh, we can see better also the, the line fracture and the irregularity on the right side of the pubic bone. So what was the diagnosis? This was a pubic apophysitis with physical fracture. So uh, a brief introduction of the pubic symphysis. Uh, the pubic symphysis is a complex anatomical structure that is a common ca cause of growing pain for different reasons, especially in athletes. It's a fibrocartilaginous joint comprised the medial surface of the pubic bones with the central fibrocartilaginous uh, disc. Uh, the pubic symphysis uh, secondary ossification centers is, uh, they appears around uh, late puberty and are said to fuse around 20 to 25 years of age. However, some uh, studies they find that the full closure of the pubic epiphysis uh, didn't occur until 35 years old and it's the last part of the human skeleton to mature. So the uh, apophysis is the location of a grown plate with a muscle attachment. There is uh, several in the pelvis uh, where the various side muscles attach. So the ventral uh, epiphysis in the anatomical literature corresponds to the pubic apophysis in contemporary imaging literature. So we have at the pubic symphysis the apophysial part with the ventral portion where we have the tendinous attachments and the epiphysial 
portion where we have the ligamentous attachment. So the apophysitis involves uh, an injury of uh, one of these uh, uh, sites of attachment and typically associated with muscle, muscle overuse. Uh, usually happen on a gradual onset and should be differentiated from avulsion injuries uh, of the pelvis, which present as an abrupt injury. So here in this image, we can see the different sites of possible avulsional injuries uh, of, or apophysitis like the ilica crest, the iliac spines, ischial tuberosity, and also the pubic symptoms. So this is other patients. Uh, we can note in this radiograph multiple sites of apophysitis. This is a 24-year-old uh, professional soccer player. So we have here apophysitis uh, uh, at the attachment of the, the, tuber, uh, the ischiatic uh, tuberosity, uh, left uh, uh, lesser trochanter and ilioxoas uh, insertion here, and also at the pelvic synthesis with some uh, sclerosis and irregularities. Uh, Sally and colleagues, they published in 2015, uh, studied with uh, 26 uh, football players. They established a clinical staging of maturations of the pubic symphysis, they divide in four groups, where stage one is the open apophysial plate without secondary ossification center, as you can see here, is stage two, where this is an open apophysial plate with secondary ossification centers. And stage three A, where there is a closed apophysial plate without secondary ossification center. And finally, uh, the late stage three B, when there is a closed apophysial plate with remaining secondary ossification center. So this, the same group of research, they also describe stress-related finds after evaluate the symptomatic and then asymptomatic athletes. And in the symptomatic uh, group, they find uh, on this CT scan, uh, stress-related change at the pubs. On A, we have the cystic-like uh, change. On B, we have the asymmetrical irregularities and some cystic change. And on C, we have an asymmetry with unilateral widening of the pubic apophysis on the right side compared with the left pubic. Here we have another case. This is an 18 year old male, also a soccer player. His MRI shows asymmetric uh, pubic apophysis was a mixture of well and well defined uh, tiny erosions due to chronic ap apophysiolysis. And another case. This is an older patient, uh, a 28 year old professional soccer player. The x-ray shows uh, a non-fusion of the secondary ossification center of the pubic symphysis on the right side here, with some degenerative change uh, with subchondral sclerosis and small uh, tiny cystic change. So the correspondent MRI, uh, this is not a protocol for symphysis, was done to evaluate the uh, tiny injury, but we can still see, uh, see the non-fusion uh, sclerotic secondary ossification center. So the treatment usually is uh, conservative, uh, reducing the uh, mechanical loading of the adductor longus, uh, reducing stress at these regions to allow normal physical development uh, in these patients. So in conclusion, uh, the PPK apophysial stress or apophysitis is an important differential consideration the young uh, athlete who presents with growing pain. Uh, public apophysitis may explain some adductor-related growing pain especially in young athletes. And the combination of the late maturation of the pubic apophysis, uh, usually more than 20 years old, and the high training loads likely contribute to the clinical picture. And the maturation of the uh, pubic symphysis is a complex process, depends on several factors, including age, uh, gender, and also sports related. Um, and although the term uh, OCI pub is, is a classic in clinical practice regarding athletes with growing pain, uh, maybe it's, it's a time to reconsider this is diagnosed in favor of a more pathological and anatomically correct description, especially when we are dealing with young patients, young athletes. Thank you. Beautiful, Tatiana. Okay, now it's my pleasure to introduce Miriam Bradella, 
who is a professor of radiology at Harvard Medical School and a musculoskeletal radiologist at the Mass General Hospital, where she serves as vice chair for faculty affairs and clinical operations and directs the MGH-wide Center for Faculty Development. She's an NIH-funded physician scientist focusing on using novel functional imaging techniques to determine the effects of different fat depots on bone and metabolic risk in states of under and, I love this, over nutrition. She's the, <laughs> she's the primary investigator of the NIH-funded Harvard KL2 Catalyst Medical Research Investigator Training Program, where she oversees the career development of clinical translational researchers across all Harvard hospitals and specialties. Um, and for those of you native Portuguese speakers, I am as challenged by those words as you must be. Um, maybe Miriam can explain that to, to us. She holds an MBA from the MIT Sloan School of Business. Fantastic. Okay, Miriam, teach us something. Thank you, Hillary. You should ask your brother about the <laughs> program because I actually work a lot with Hillary's brother, who is a clinical translational researcher, and that researcher does similar thing that I do. So it's a great pleasure to be here. You just give me a thumbs up whether you can see my screen or down. Perfect. So I'm going to start. It's a great honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And we will start with a 17-year-old female runner presented with right-sided hip pain. This is the radiograph. We didn't really see anything. So because she had continued pain, we went on to get an MRI. Here are coronal stir images. I'm going to go through them, but it's not subtle. You see the marrow edema on the right femoral neck. And here are the T1-weighted images. Again, they're not um, not very subtle. And this was a femoral neck stress fracture. Great. You dictate this next, um, next case and you move on. However, if you look carefully, this woman did not have a lot of fat. She doesn't look anorexic, but she had a low BMI, sort of low normal, 18.5, and an oligoamenorrhea, so irregular menstrual periods. And she had something called the female athlete triad, which is a combination of one or more of these three entities. And it starts typically with an energy deficit. That means the women don't eat enough for the amount of exercise they're doing. And this could just be eating a power bar at lunch instead of a real meal, or it can be an eating disorder. And that leads to menstrual disturbances, oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea, not having any periods, and then bone loss or osteoporosis. So as I said, there's a spectrum. So it can be from just mild disordered eating. As I said, you just don't eat enough to um, an oligomenorrhea and a stress fracture to a frank eating disorder, either anorexia nervosa or bulimia or um, amenorrhea, total loss of periods and frank osteoporosis. What is important that it's really um, important to recognize athletes who have these subclinical abnormalities so we can intervene because these pubertal years or early um, for adolescents, early adulthood are really critical in building up peak bone mass so any process during adolescence that impairs bone accrual can have really negative consequences later in life, like onset of osteoporosis is earlier and more fractures. So there are now screening forms to, um, for these pre-participation physical evaluation, at least in the US, that really screen for the female athlete triad and young girls. You can see these are the questions. They focus on menstrual history, on weight. Do you worry about your weight? Has anyone recommended that you lose weight? And then on bone, have you ever had a stress fracture? And then the last one, have you ever been told that you have low bone mineral density? So how would you know this? So this then raises the question, who should get a DEXA scan to look for osteoporosis? And there are some criteria that you see here. If you have an eating disorder, weight, low weight or weight loss, late menarche or um, low number of menstrual periods. And if you have a stress, history of stress fracture in high um, risk, a high risk fracture and a prior low bone BMD. So this is going back to our patient age. So she was instructed to do eight weeks of non-weight bearing. 
So here are the um, coronal fluid sensitive sequences. You can see there has been improvement in the marrow hema of the femoral neck, but it's still a little bit there. Also seen here on the uh, T1 weighted images. She went back, um, go running, presented six months later, and here you see she can be black pain. She has now a stress reaction in her um, tibia. So then that raises the question, when should uh, patients who have the female athlete try to return to play? Because that's something really important. If you use the regular criteria, which they did in her case, uh, you might just not be ready to start running or do other um, activities. So there are actually some forms that um, evaluate when you should return to play, um, whether you're low risk, moderate risk, or high risk. And again, they focus on eating disorder, BMI, menarche, and BMD. And then you get a certain amount of points, and then you can see whether you have a low risk, moderate risk, or high risk. Um, a different case, 18-year-old female runner with left hip pain, and this is not very subtle. You can see a fracture. Now it's not a stress fracture anymore. This went through and through through the entire femoral neck, so there was no non-weight bearing anymore. This was pinned. Because the patient was a very enthusiastic runner, she thought, oh, I can start running again, did not really wait very long. This is the CT scan. So here, see what happened. She started running again. And now you see this periosteal reaction um, in the uh, like diaphysis, medial diaphysis here. And so she developed a stress fracture in the um, femoral shaft. So again, there is something wrong with the bones of these patients. So you have to be extra careful um, when you start returning to play. And they typically need a longer time of um, weight bearing or of sports. We talked a lot about women. Now let's go for a 20 year old male long distance runner uh, presented with leg pain. This is also not very subtle. A lot of marrow edema of the tibia, there's periosteal reaction. Here are coronal images and you see a stress fracture. And these are just some coronal images, T1 weighted images through the calf. You can see that there, this man has really no fat whatsoever. And he had something called the male athlete triad, also called relative energy deficiency in sports or red syndrome. Very similar to the women, you have low starts out with low energy availability, and then you have low bone mineral density and the men have actually low testosterone. And that is sort of a counterpart to the amenorrhea. We do a lot of research on the topic. This patient got a DEXA scan, like a whole body DEXA to look for body composition, the amount of fat and muscle mass, but also for bone. And you can see um, on the fat mass for high that he, with this age of 20, was in the very, very lowest range. And he also was underweight. And below you see see the testosterone level that were lower than what is expected in the normal range. Here is his DEXA for bone, and I just want to highlight our technologists always ask about prior fracture. At the age of 20, he already had a stress fracture of the right femur and both pelvic bones. At his age of 20, he had the total BMD was sort of in the lower osteopenic areas where you have increased fracture risk but his uh, bone mineral density of the spine put him in the high fracture risk rate. So he also went back on running, came back two years later, and um, you can see here a stress fracture of the proximal tibia. So that brings me to conclude, how do you manage these patients with a female or male athlete triad? And that is a very complicated um, issue because it requires several different people who all have to work together. It's really a multidisciplinary approach. You need a nutritionist, you need a psychologist, because often, um, the, especially women who are doing gymnastics or ballet, they are told to be really thin. And if they lose their periods, that's actually a good thing. So you have to have a psychologist. The coach has to be absolutely on board. And you need the orthopedist and endocrinologist. Sometimes it's very easy. You just modify your diet, do a full fat yogurt instead of low fat, or just increase your calorie and um, decrease your exercise regimen. It's the balance. You either eat more or exercise less. 
of course, for bone health, you have to optimize calcium and vitamin D intake and, um, and then see, and what is really important is that once you have a stress fracture that you um, don't, you have to wait longer and see when can you return to play. What I just want to emphasize and conclude with is that you as a radiologist may actually be the first to diagnose the male or female athlete, try it. And I want to end my presentation here. Next time you see a stress fracture, just go the extra mile, look at the body composition. And if they look really thin, maybe go into the medical record, see whether there are any other signs that they maybe suggest that this could be female or male athlete triad. Thank you so much. It was really interesting, Miriam. I just want to jump in with my question because it relates to your presentation. I, I read a fair amount of uh, uh, DEXA and I never really... I'm always curious what uh, the clinicians do with the information when they order DEXA in these um, young premenopausal women. I, I, I wasn't thinking about young men. I don't see very many on young men. Um, but, you know, the World Health Organization guidelines, uh, you know, don't, um, don't apply to these uh, under 50 premenopausal women for osteoporosis, osteopenia. If they're more than two standard deviations below, we can say it's reduced, but what do they do with that information? Um, great question, Hillary. They are using, we're using for the young people Z scores, so we're not using the T scores. The Z scores is compared to your peers, normal peers. So if you have a 15 year old girl, it's going to be compared to a 15 year old girl who is normal. But we, um, our, you have to have an expert who really knows this stuff. So what we do, we refer them to endocrinologists because even the sports people are not that familiar. So we have sports endocrinologists who then start them on treatment. They actually get started, maybe not the sponsonates, but other uh, PTH to increase their bone health, uh, bone density if they have more stress. Like for KO, they actually take, they take PTH? Some, if there are some who have um, like high risk stress fractures, femoral neck and multiple or the foot stress fractures and three, four, five, we actually have some experimental protocols mm -hmm. where we do PTH and, and other things. We have a study on IGF-1 and anorexia nervosa. So we, because this, it's a very specialized group, um, we do actually use the excess and recommend them and use the information to guide treatment and medical treatment because often the uh, eating or nutritional counseling just does not work. Thank you. I have a question to Connie. Do you use contrast in your hand protocol in trauma cases? And do you think it helps better than delineate the structures, Connie? Uh, we do not. Uh, I guess you would be sort of like an indirect arthrogram. Um, and um, we don't, especially with all the complications. I mean, uh, you know, well, like Miriam's reported on deposition of gadolinium in the brain, you know, like I think uh, we try to avoid contrast if possible. Um, I found, I, I briefly mentioned this, but I found the proton density actually can be really helpful as a supplement to, because um, the, the slices are thinner you know, you're getting more signal and it can help be helpful. You know, I think the temptation, especially for myself, is to always go for the fat suppressed images first, but um, the proton density can be really helpful. But anyway, sorry, that's a long answer to your question. No, we don't use contrast. <laughs> Thank you. Now I have a question to follow. Uh, what are the key imaging features to look at when evaluating the post-operative knees regarding cartilage repair, uh, thickness, signal, what else? Oh, we can talk about that that a lot. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> just the key imaging features. <laughs> yeah, uh, what we're looking for is to have a regular uh, cartilage, uh, regular tissue covering the defect of the. So, what we have is the surface of the tissue covering the defect has to be similar to the native cartilage around it. So, so it has to be as smoother as possible. Uh, in large defects that especially when you have like more alternative treatments 
you may have some more irregularities in the in the interface between the native uh, cartilage and the and the graft or anything anything you're using, but you're looking for the goal is to have a, 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 a tissue covering the defect as uh, smoother as possible and uh, and uh, at the level of the native cartilage and with no fluid. Uh, between those two and especially beneath the the graft or the or the membrane or anything you're using so this is what we're looking for okay thank you do you have another question hillary or anyone from the audience okay so i want to thank you all for joining us thank you all our guest speakers and our next session will be on October 14th, 14th uh, a little bit earlier next month. And see you then. Bye-bye. Thank you.